the Summer Line House is an international organization, and it contacts all seekers, explaining the microcosm of man and his relationship to the macrocosmos of God. The Summit Lighthouse is the lighthouse of the Ascended Masters. And I can sincerely see why the Ascended Masters have chosen Mark Prophet as their beacon. He is a completely dedicated individual in truth and honor to produce only what the Masters dictate to him without any imposing of his personal self or the human element. To verify what I say, you have an opportunity to get the pearls of wisdom, which are issued weekly, and they are available to all without any charge. Or you can examine the uh, dictations of the masters, their other writings. Who are these ascended masters I'm speaking of? They are the same masters of wisdom who dictated to Madame Blavatsky the volumes of the secret doctrine, to Alice Bailey the treatises of cosmic fire, initiation, the seven rays. They have also dictated to many writers books of a landmark value that many of you refer to. They are also the masters who started the Masonic Orders, the Rosicrucians, the benevolent brotherhood of fraternities that are throughout the earth today and inspire many of us. Now, as the masters of God's lore and order, are willing to use Bishop Prophet, then we at least can hear him, examine the writings of these masters, uh, which are, by the way, in the table at the back, and then from all this you may draw your own conclusions. But do turn towards this, your glorious opportunity. Ladies and gentlemen, Bishop Mark Prophet. Mr. Donald Knight and distinguished guests and friends of the unfailing light of God, I deem it a very real privilege to be here tonight in this gathering of souls who have within them a spark of the eternal flame. Driving through the mountains of Tennessee recently, we stopped to ask an elderly man the way to Coffee Hill School. Well, miss, said the native, you go down here until you come to Hanging Rock. And then, you know where that is, don't you? No, replied my friend, I don't believe I do. Well, that's where you turn off and go on two miles until you get to Tumbling Creek. You know where that is, don't you? <laughs> no, I don't. I'm sorry, miss, said the native, shaking his head regretfully. I don't think you know enough for me to tell you anything. <laughs> You know, the mirror of consciousness can be self-limiting. Some people see themselves in everything. Others see everything in themselves, while still others synthesize and see both ways. And it is cause, effect, record, and memory of our own life experiences that serves to integrate reality for each of us. Living as we do in the glowing bubble of a radiant spiritual material universe, we ought to learn to form a vital integrated consciousness 
around a central atom of purpose. In order to find this purpose, we need to evolve within ourselves a perpetually new idea of the world, of time, and of space. Hopefully, this will be God's primeval idea that reveals all of the universe and its glorious opportunity alive within our consciousness. We see this glory within the smile of a child, in a bouquet of lilacs, in the golden glow of the sun upon a field of waving grain, in the faces of the young and the mature. And we are not always able to define it and then to make it practical in our daily living. What then is this glory that makes our opportunity to be an embodiment worthwhile? The great spiritual thinker, Erasmus of Rotterdam said, and I quote, truly the yoke of Christ would be sweet and his burdens light if petty human institutions added nothing to what he himself imposed. He commanded us nothing save love for one another." Unquote. There is always the danger of losing the meaning of sacred words or ideas by oversimplification. This can also be accomplished by overcomplication. The world is waiting, hoping, and looking for a strong spiritual leadership. We doubt if there are many among national, religious, educational, or even industrial leaders who intend to mislead the people. Yet it is indeed for want of vision of the foresight of illumined leaders that the people perish. Midst all of the corruption that is in the world, there are many honest and good men, but these are often of diverse persuasions and they see one another as enemies in the battle for the minds of men instead of brothers in the war against evil forces that divide us. Frankly, it is difficult to see just how people can so complicate their lives as to lose sight of the magnificent principle of divine love which ought to be apparent in our ordinary communication. And it is hard to believe that all do not recognize the organization of darkness that seeks to destroy the love and light of the Christ that is the best and only hope and our most glorious opportunity. Unfortunately, far too often, individuals of different persuasions or concepts without even realizing it become involved in a vain sense of competition. Competition leads to the assertion of the ego. It engenders pride in the ambition to excel no matter what the cost to the soul. Then there arises the need to defend the personality and with it a host of undesirable qualities which affect all within the individual's circle of influence. Lashing out like punch drunk prize fighters, even religious people caught in the pressures of our competitive world present the ugly example of discord to the very one they were sent to teach. They argue doctrine while ignoring the spirit of the living faith that beckons them to follow in the master's footsteps. Through dissension, criticism, gossip, and cruel competitiveness, the very cause they seek to serve is cast down. Their students are left bewildered and dazed by their statements made in condemnation of other leaders and their followers, and they who have played the part of the Antichrist 
remain coolly indifferent to the chaos that is strewn in the wake of their unfortunate selfish activities. Men and women everywhere look to positive leadership to guide them along life's way unerringly toward the living Christ and toward the principles of the great brotherhood of light. And so they should. If we would lead and be led, our goal should be centered then in the formation and structuring of the Christ within. For as long as we allow even one erg of God's energy, which he gives to us each day, to flow into a spirit of competition, we are crucifying the Christ who would form himself within us right here and now in this age. Whenever we sense forces of division working in ourselves, whenever out of sheer honesty we admit our unwillingness to be seamless, to exorcise the spirits of disunity, we must face the fact that we are thereby lowering our potential to meet our glorious opportunity. And what's more, we are failing not only to weave but also to wear the seamless garment of the master. Unity of purpose is our golden mean for the practice of the golden rule. And practice we must if this conference is to achieve the goal of a spiritual unity of nations and peoples. Otherwise, we will have a flow of words without works. When we engage in struggle and a subtle sense of being jealous or competitive with others, we literally place a crown of thorns around our own heads and around the master's head. He would have us wear instead a laurel wreath of divine intelligence that would impart to us intuitively the knowledge of how the battle will be won for God and for truth, why the very pores of our being should release the fragrance of the rose that is the essence of the harmony of the Christ who breathes within our souls. The single eye vision has no part with double eye vision. The power of the all-seeing eye reflected in man reveals the radiant light of purpose that illumines the pages of this age and integrates the action of the self with God. Thus the meaningful structuring of the light of the Christ expands within each one of us through the single eye vision that God gave to man in the beginning. The expanding dimensions that are perceived through the eye of the Spirit convey a sense of oneness with the Father that cannot exclude one's fellow men, that will never impale them upon the spikes of criticism. On the contrary, this sense of oneness can only exalt the truth in all people. We should learn to relate the impersonal God to the personal God in our relationships with people. For no matter how impersonal we may try to be in emulation of what we suppose to be the will of God, in the final analysis, the real victory is attained through the alchemical marriage of the impersonal love of God with the personal love of the Christ. When we understand correctly the principle of the impersonal, personal, personality of God, we can walk the razor's edge of being in the world and yet not being of the world. We can express the very personal, impersonal love of God in a world where people literally either love or hate one another to death for want of balance. And the ability to see, take note of this, to see and thus resurrect the living Christ in every man we see. We must be alert to human traits that subtly 
drain the spirit, and vampirize our energies, detracting from our glorious opportunity and adding to the welter of world confusion. We should draw instead from the universal source, the grace which is sufficient for every need today, and preserve it in a spirit of harmony that refuses to be moved by outer circumstances. Let us be aware of the interaction of the power and principle of the living Christ and the glorious opportunity into which every man may drink. This opportunity centers around responding to human need by living a life of understanding. Let us perceive that people have different backgrounds. Their education is not equal. Their moral endowments are not the same. Their state of health varies and all have limitations of one sort or another. If we would serve them as ambassadors of the sun, we must learn to practice tolerance of others, giving the Christ who lives in them the opportunity to express himself and to bring about their purification and their spiritual development without interference from our personal concepts of them as persons. People and organizations, nations, planets, and solar systems are all in a state of becoming. We must bend the bow of effort with the universal intent and not allow ourselves to remain involved in a myopic, oftentimes destructive examination of what might have been, what others have done, or what they will do. This superior attitude marks the difference between a master and a disciple. And so the master has said, greater things shall ye do because I go unto the Father. When we learn to overcome the bad habit of criticizing and condemning others by seeking to resurrect the Christ that is within them which the Lord God himself saw in the beginning as their unlimited potential, we can accept the master's words in as much as ye have done it unto the least of these, my brethren. Ye have done it unto me. O oh, wretched insincerity, God deliver us from the banal ignorance that presumes that we can escape retribution for any vile deed done to any man. None can, none will, yet of greater hope is the certain knowledge that no one will ever fail to be rewarded by the spirit of love that keeps on erring score of the good that we are wont to do and of the good we do. It has well been said that salvation is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And the truth speaks on saying, it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And this is our glorious opportunity, to let God work through us and not to stand in the way. Then our handiwork will truly become the work of God. And then we can acknowledge him as the grand architect of our lives and of our glorious destiny. Let us be mindful then that whereas the young are able to change their course, and hopefully men and women of all ages will also be able to change their course where needed, still there are many who will be unable to make a basic change in the foundation of their faith, even for the sake of the higher teachings of the Christ whom they love. However, progressive revelation indicates the wisdom of cosmic adaptability. Many of the cardinal principles will remain in the new age, fixed on the bedrock of dogma. Wise is the man who foresees the need to make reasonable adjustments in his search for truth. The race is not of necessity to the swift or to the strong, but always to the sincere. 
With God, all things are possible. We today can expect to be changed from a relative glory to a greater glory as a part of our glorious opportunity. As Matthew Arnold said, the seeds of God-like power are in us still. Gods we are, saints, heroes, if we will. Unquote. We should then seek to guide and be guided to focal points of greater opportunity, where our sense of unity will help us to return to the primeval principle so beautifully simplified by Erasmus' words, he commanded us nothing save love one for another. A new commandment give I unto you that ye love one another. Was this really a new commandment or simply a rephrasing of the original commandment of God? To ears dulled by centuries of self-centered living, it is always new. And these must reorient their lives to revolve around the central sun of being which will make the universal unity of men and nations a living reality because it is based upon the principle of the one. The scriptures record, my spirit shall not always strive with man for that he also is flesh. Yet we find a valiant effort on the part of the heavenly host to serve embodied humanity, to raise his consciousness and his flesh to the place where he can manifest in the flesh the higher principles of truth in action. God seeks to draw men and women of all nations and persuasions into a great parliament of universal love that will put an end for all time to bickering, to criticism, condemnation, and judgment, and enable groups such as those who are participating in this Sun Conference not only to love, but also to forgive one another for whatever shortcomings may become apparent individually or collectively. St. Paul said long ago, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We doubt not that our glorious opportunities have been marred in the past by the dullness of our selfish efforts and our attempts to do our own thing. While it is true that individuals see the world through their own eyes, it is also a fact that the grace of God can cause the scales to fall from our eyes, establishing within us a new sense of justice and promoting true peace among men and nations. The great brotherhood of light, the great white brotherhood that has so untiringly served the cause of freedom for this planet has sought to bequeath to man political, social, and religious freedom. The masters continue day after day, hour after hour in service to humanity, striving to create the garments of the body of God upon earth. Long ago, Jesus was embodied as Joseph, the idle dreamer, who wore the coat of many colors. The rainbow rays, seven in number, with him were the eleven brothers, later to become his apostles, who would instantly respond to his call, follow me. Now as the ages have rolled on, and the great passions of spiritual evolution have carried the great master through his nativity, Christhood, and ascension, we perceive how he has actually woven a literal swaddling garment of his divine love and light that is the seamless white garment of his robe. Go and do thou likewise is his command to us today. We can if we wish immerse ourselves by what I would term a misuse of our free will in an inkpot consciousness that seeks to inscribe its own name and fame and personality upon the universe. Or, as a shining dewdrop, we can joyously slip into the beautiful sea of the spirit, merging with the eternal light our holy Christ self. 
It is the goal of the brotherhood to renew life in ourselves and in our fellow men by what we may call, and this is a cosmic principle we're dealing with now, the principle of cosmic flow. By enhancing our awareness and our use of the continual and unending flow of energy from God to man. For it is the flow of God's energy which provides man with the glorious opportunity of choosing moment by moment how he will serve his fellow men. The brotherhood seeks to elevate and to unite, not to degrade or untie, to transmute darkness and to replace it by light. In this 20th century, with all of the scientific miracles that have been given to man in order to facilitate his spiritual development and opportunity, our office should be one of the spirit of reaching out to the multitudes of earth as the voice, not of one, but of many, crying in the wilderness and saying unto the age, make straight the way of the Lord. Yet there are those who fear even to utter his name, those who fear to be thought religious or godly, those who would not even look for understanding, for surely in their sophistication and in their sophisticated sense, they already possess all understanding. We recently learned of a woman who actually resigned from a spiritual organization because the size, the physical size, of the lessons to which she was subscribing did not fit her bookcase. <laughs> Some people say churches should be all air conditioned, for it is unhealthy for people to sleep in a stuffy room. <laughs> Others think the Sunday service is like a convention. Many families send just one delegate. Then there is the story of the Saturday night backslider who suddenly began attending church faithfully on Sunday morning. The pastor was highly gratified and told him how wonderful it makes me feel to see you at services with your good wife. Well, Parson, said the prodigal, it is a matter of choice. I would rather hear your sermon than hers. <laughs> Only a few seem to be willing as little children to learn living truth, to have the God of reality take them by the hand and show them the power of his love to melt away their burdens, to ease the pathway for millions who walk in darkness, that they may see the great light. This is our hope. We live in a world where Christianity has been father and mother to much of Western society. We live in a world where the pathways of the East, of the Buddha, Confucius, and Lao Tzu are still foreign to many minds. We live in an age where education is everywhere, yet ignorance abounds. Together we cry, what must I do to be saved? Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Good master, what must I do? What correct use must I make of my glorious opportunity, of this life that beats my heart, of this power that guides my mind through the trackless air, of this flood of intimate nearness, breathing witness of thyself, of this awareness that thou art. Because thou art, I am. This faith in the masters of wisdom and in our united future, this faith that would raise the understanding of the aged ere the sands of their life run out, this faith that would guide youth before the sullying smut of improper associations have done their corrosive work, of pulling the young soul down into the morasses of human ignorance and eventual self-condemnation, this faith must live in us and actively engage us in the victorious service of leading humanity to the feet of God. In rallying then to the service of the King of Kings, in picking up the fallen torch of organized Christianity and other forms of organized religion, whose sense of form has broken the spirit thereof, we must bear well in mind the words, go ye out into the highways and byways 
and compel them to come in. Only by manifesting a togetherness in the eternal Son, a togetherness that we have not had before, can we sublimate our individual egos and organizational standards to a common cause. Let us determine to ray out a genuine friendship for the eternal God that walks also in the garments of our brethren. Whatever their faith or their demeanor at a given moment in time, we can vigorously affirm their true identity as sons and daughters of the living God, hence offspring of his will. We can teach men to overthrow the satanic treachery of self-condemnation that reflects against the world and thus keeps all groveling in the mire of hopelessness and changelessness. We can raise each one we meet in his own esteem. We can raise him in our esteem. We can raise his estimation of his own potential by revealing and acknowledging his higher self. We can avoid the sin of drawing curtain of negative thought that men professing to be servants of God sometimes lower on those who have been sent to reenact the eternal drama of the Christ. We should see that the thoughts of men and women of the spirit are more powerful than the world's thought and therefore our thoughts must be used wisely and constructively. We must move forward strong to energize, to harmonize, to love, and to execute the will of God on earth, and thus create an unbroken flanks, an indomitable union that will bring forth without fail the kingdom of God upon this planet. How dare we think of failure when the fate of the world hangs in the balance of the Christ consciousness in all Liberty comes not through any one of us. It comes through all of us collectively. As Khalil Gibran said in his book, The Prophet, but I say that even as the holy and the righteous cannot rise beyond the highest, which is in each one of you, so the wicked and the weak cannot fall lower than the lowest, which is in you also. The book of Proverbs says, there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. This is the way of the ego, the energy goal, of self-centeredness, of doubt, and of fear, born out of man's self-imposed exile from his God. All self-limiting tendencies must be shed, and the serpentine force that creeps upon its belly, upon its emotions, through the grass of human vanity, it too must be shed. And we must raise upon the cross in its place, in the wilderness of human consciousness, the golden serpent of holy wisdom that all who look upon it may live. And I want to add to that phrase, as gods. That all who look upon it may live as gods. And that means belonging to him as well as becoming him. We must replace our dependence upon carnal knowledge with total reliance upon holy wisdom. We must seek the way of the cross as the shining pathway where God and man meet. Let us find the God within ourselves and finding him there, find him also in others. Let us resurrect the God in ourselves that we may also resurrect him in others. In ascending to God, let us draw all men unto the living Christ and provide them with a new and living way whereby they too can come up over whatsoever hinders their individual attainment of freedom and victory. In view of the increasing drive toward union on many levels, which often lacks the necessary unity to be effective. In view of the parallel and self-evident need to draw ourselves together as a vessel 
wholly consecrated unto God and to his exaltation among the family of nations, we must beware of what can be properly called the Tower of Babel concept. This is a pitfall that is very much with us. It is a concept that seeks a mere union of nations and organizations that is not reflective of a unity of the spirit or motivated in the purity of the divine plan. It is an attempt at organizational union that does not recognize the voices of individuals as lively stones to be placed by the hand of the master mason into the foundation of the eternal temple of the sun. We must preserve a cosmic ethic. Whatever our chosen pathway, if it be correct, it should lead us to God. And as there is but one God, albeit there be many manifestations of that one, the leading of ourselves to God cannot help but unite us to one another and to draw us more closely together in the bonds of Christ's love. For if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we will have fellowship one with another. Yet Jesus said, if the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? Showing that men may misqualify their light and thereby produce darkness that is not compatible with unity. Therefore, whatsoever the form may be, he who is both the form maker and the form breaker can take us by the hand and show us how to make full use of his glorious opportunity that lives in the eternal now, yesterday, today, and always. This is the opportunity that walked on the crumbling bricks of Babylon, the opportunity that followed the Christ on the Via Dolorosa, the opportunity that stood with St. Paul on Mars Hill, the opportunity that exalted with St. Peter at the meeting place Quo Vadis in Rome, the opportunity that entered the wilderness of America with the early pilgrims, the opportunity that prayed for the rise of faith as this young nation, America, expanded her wings in that wilderness and sought to bring forth the living Christ, the opportunity that quivers in the bow of truth and rallies to meet every challenge of the red dragon, which sends forth from its mouth a flood of unwholesome books, movies, and television shows to poison our youth, the opportunity that stays the arm that would use organized religion as a political weapon to effect a fraudulent social justice and trample the nations under the communist boot. This is the opportunity that helps the Divine Mother by swallowing up the flood and preserving the hope of freedom and victory to all mankind. Whatever the tenets of our faith, then, we must see to it that as we build together, we build no vain tower of Babel that can only bring about a confusion of tongues, but a clear and clarion voice that speaks and implements the simple tones of sweet and knowledgeable love. For this love must not be a love that ignores the laws of God, but a love of wisdom, embracing the Holy Virgin the divine Theosophia, this love must hold the fire of the ascended master's consciousness in the living chalice of self. It must avail itself of its glorious opportunity in the stillness of the night, in the brightness of the noonday, in the communion of the saints, in the practice of service to humanity. We dare not linger, for the night is far spent, and the day is at hand. The master said, the way ye know, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Behold, he who keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. Even in this day and age, the masters are speaking the mysteries of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom that from the foundation of the world has been declared. As they said, the soldiers said it at the foot of the cross, truly 
And these were Roman soldiers. Truly, this man was the son of God. The pagans recognized him. As we gather then together at the foot of the cross, we see the soldiers of Rome in their doleful ignorance still casting lots over the beautiful robe of the master, the seamless garment and object of chattel. For men today would also make merchandise of the kingdom of God. Yet he is declared, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. If we would understand the foregoing, if we would truly understand it with our hearts, we must relinquish our heads, our cares, and our sense of concern for the personal self, and in the gesture of sweet surrender to the divine mentor, to the divine mother, beholding the agus of the Father's hand and individual master plan for us. We can even now experience a foretaste of that blending together of souls that is born by the winds of the Holy Spirit, fresh from the altars of heaven. We can experience within ourselves a sacred renewal of the fires of Pentecost, understanding the meaning of Agni, of the sacred fire. We can experience a unity with the self that will truly make us one with God and thus with all mankind. Our glorious opportunity is to provide insight and example to the world of what God has wrought within ourselves. I doubt not that if we could more clearly see the handwriting on the wall, the sweet love that even now is ready to write our name upon his record as one who loves God most, we would at least in thought and vow swing the censers of our souls through the sunlit air and say, O oh God, where'er thou art, let me be too. Where'er thou art, let me commune with you in clutching childlike hand or aged trembling limb. Give me the power of Christ each hour, extending will to win to every soul I meet perchance upon the road of life. O oh God, reach down right through my heart with liberty and life. Thy gift most precious is thyself. Teach me to give like thee that we together in this world may serve to make men free. When I took Latin, the first sentence I learned was, via magna et longa est. The road is large and long, and it still is. It still is. And now I know that if this Sun Conference or any conference of spiritual devotees is to take advantage of its glorious opportunity. It must be because we love, because we are free, because we love, because we are free for those who are truly free to love. Do so without reserve, without mental reservation. They know that there is no need to protect the self. For God has already wrapped his hands about us one and all. If we feel the need to rise to our own defense, we know we must expand our awareness of the protective power of his love. Let us then be ready to defend him against all enemies, to uphold the vision of him to the world, to uphold in the eyes of the young neophyte the vision of the Christ reality of themselves, to take our responsibilities more seriously than we have ever done before. Never to mind the straining of the bow or the strength we exert, for the arrow will fly far and reach its mark. Let us who have gathered for this Sun Conference highly resolve under God and through the power of his love to reconsecrate ourselves to our individual vows whatever they may be, 
And let us pray, God, that we may incur willingly, joyously, greater depths of service and responsibility of wholeness. And if we do our part, we know that the glowing fire of the body of God up on earth will no longer be a young man discoursing in the temple, but a fully radiant Christ whose strength will be readily apparent, whose effulgent garments billowing in the winds of purpose and in the fire of renewed hope will take the world by storm, going out into the highways and byways and gathering the multitudes as sheaves into the holy granaries of God as the treasures of this age and of all ages past. Dear hearts, the young, the aged, people all over the land cry out for spiritual bread. They implore heaven to give us manna. Our responsibility lives in us. Let us live in our responsibilities. So help us, God, so unite us in Christ, so unite us in his love, so fulfill the yoke of Christ in his burden of light. So shall we avail ourselves of our glorious opportunities together. Thank you. Amen.